Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, I'm not a businessman. Um, my business is theoretical physics. Uh, I study the Big Bang and the singularity and whether there was time before it. But I'm actually not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about special places. Can I have the first slide? Next slide. <laughs> Look at this picture. So this is uh, ancient Greece, the School of Athens by Raphael. Uh, look at these people. Does it look like a school? <laughs> this is a place where people shared ideas, uh, th saw the world with fresh eyes, invented notions of democracy, liberty. Uh, it's a school I would have loved to have gone to. But see over here on the left, what was at the heart of it was mathematics and science. Pythagoras was the person who invented the, the name mathematics. And uh, looking over his shoulder um, is Anaximander, the first scientist, who drew the first map, uh, thought of the concept of infinity, and did the form first scientific experiment. And you see what he's doing. Uh, that's what we do as theoretical physicists. We cheat. <laughs> we look over the shoulder of the mathematicians to, to see uh, mathematical truths. These are the most profound truths we know of. But we're, we also have the other eye on the real world because we're trying to describe reality. And that's exactly, we use all available means to figure out how the world really works. I want to point out another coincidence in this picture, which is you see the birth of mathematics and the concept of proof. Um, Pythagoras was the first person who ever proved anything. He proved Pythagoras' theorem. But that concept is profoundly related to the notion of justice. Because in a court, what do you do if, if, if you want to show somebody is guilty? You've got to prove it. And the concepts go together. Now, um, I've, led, I, I, I've led a very lucky life. And my luck began a few years I was, before I was born when um, my father was tried uh, for treason in South Africa. Um, uh, there's my father. And uh, alongside him was this person, who you should probably recognize. And uh, it was my good fortune to be raised in a family committed to a struggle to change the world, which ultimately succeeded. And this was a long-term enterprise, as you said. This took, uh, uh, you know, uh, nearly four decades uh, from this picture. But they wouldn't give up. They believed uh, things would change. And that was the spirit in which uh, I was raised. Well, as a, as a child, um, I got into science. Um, collecting beetles, playing with experiments, doing mathematics. Um, the, the, the 60s were, uh, was an era of great hope uh, and, and optimism. And we left South Africa, or after my parents had both been to jail, we left South Africa, and we lived in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania, um, uh, young countries, uh, really with, uh, uh, with uh, incredible hope for the future at that time. And after that, we went to London, uh, to the UK, and arrived just in time to see this, uh, Buzz Aldrin walking on the moon. And that was the spirit of, of, uh, of my childhood, is that there was nothing that couldn't be done uh, if you put your mind to it. Well, after that, I returned to Africa as a teenager to teach in a school in Lesotho, a small landlocked country uh, surrounded by apartheid South Africa. And I lived in a hut like that one and taught in the local school for a year. And I met many uh, wonderful kids. And I could see the talent that was there, enormous talent. But those kids never had a chance. Uh, the best they could hope for was work as uh, migrant, uh, migrant workers in South Africa over the border. Um, 
And uh, no matter how smart they were, um, they could not, there was no way they could succeed. And it struck me then, and it strikes me now, that here is the greatest uh, asset, with all respect to your minds, the greatest asset the world has is its young people. And most of them are utterly denied uh, the opportunity to realize their potential. So my experience in Africa uh, affected me deeply. Now, um, in the village, in an African village, um, at night, it's a pretty scary place. There's no light. There's uh, dogs barking. Um, and people believe in magic. And Lesotho is famous for its magic. Uh, they believe that uh, old ladies fly at night, uh, naked. They believe that uh, you can make an effigy out of, uh, out of uh, flour and water and herbs, and at night it will turn into a little devil and go and kill your enemy. And so magic was huge, and uh, frequently encountered this in class as I was teaching, and I showed them some demonstration like electricity from you rubbing a balloon on your hair. And they would shout, Tokoloshi, the word for a wizard. But uh, so after this experience, I went back to England, to Cambridge, where I studied theoretical physics. And uh, Isaac Newton, the inventor of the subject, the greatest mathematician of all time, um, I didn't know at the time he was actually a wannabe magician. Uh, that's the story of Isaac Newton. He spent more than half his time on alchemy, um, trying to create gold. Again, connects <laughs> to your... Um, he failed. All he succeeded in doing was in poisoning himself with mercury, uh, from which he died. But the point is, the other part of his time, he spent on mathematics and, and physics. And we remember him for that because his physics was the magic that worked. Um, and he, he figured out how the laws of motion, not by studying everyday things on Earth, but by staring at the heavens and the data from the planets, which told him uh, how mechanics works, how gravitation worked. And they work in truly magical ways. Uh, they they obey, obey mathematical laws, which govern them to phenomenal precision. And of course, the laws he discovered are the foundation for all of engineering and all the projects uh, we do today. Um, but uh, this basic discovery uh, of magic in the world underlies all of modern science and technology. And following Newton came Maxwell, who discovered, who tried to reconcile magnetism with electricity mathematically and in a, a single picture, and in resolving the contradictions, discovered what light is. This is probably the greatest discovery of all time in physics, to figure out some equations and suddenly it emerges, this is light, uh, this is radio waves. Um, and then came Einstein, who had to reconcile what Maxwell did with what Newton did, and in so doing, discovered relativity and space-time, the fact space and time are unified. And yes, I'm happy to ask, answer questions afterwards on those very fast neutrinos, which were seen last week, um, but probably are not going faster than the speed of light. Um, and so, uh, Einstein uh, paved the way for, um, for all of modern, uh, modern physics in the 20th century. And it's been a fantastic enterprise, which unfortunately has been hidden from most people. Because this enterprise of unraveling all the laws of nature has been phenomenally successful. And so here's a single formula that summarizes all known physics in one line. OK, we have Schrodinger, who discovered that the world is not deterministic. It's, it's described by an amplitude, which, which tells us the possibilities and the probabilities for everything. We have Planck, who discovered quantization and just survives as a constant in this formula. The square root of minus one. 
a mathematical idea, seems uh, intrinsic in physics. Newton also, and he survives as a constant, because Einstein m discovered the real law of, of space-time and gravity, at least the one we have for the moment. Maxwell discovered electricity, magnetism, and light, generalized by Yang and Mills to the force, the, the weak and the strong force of nuclear physics. And then Dirac discovered the equation which describes three quarters of the known particles, the electrons, the protons, the quarks, neutrinos, uh, all of these particles. And then Kobayashi Maskawa and Yukawa discovered how particles get their mass um, by uh, introducing this term in Dirac's theory. And this phi is the mass, uh, the origin of mass. It's the Higgs field. And as you know, the greatest experiment of all time, the Large Hadron Collider, is running right now. And over the next six months, uh, if not sooner, we should know if the Higgs field exists, if this formula is correct. So it's an amazingly accurate and complete picture of the basic laws of nature, which is, uh, which, which is without uh, equal, without parallel in science. Using this formula, you can calculate quantities to one part in a trillion, uh, and they are correct. Um, and so I would really claim this is indeed uh, magic that works. Our mathematical understanding of the world is incredibly powerful. It's our most valuable possession. Uh, I'm sorry, but money doesn't grab me. Uh, but this does. Understanding of the world really does. It's completely free to share. You can explain this equation to somebody from Bangladesh or Cameroon, uh, and, and with enough, enough effort, they will understand it. Uh, it's written in Greek, by the way, you will have noticed, in homage to the, to the Greeks. But the most interesting thing about it is it's just the beginning. This is not the final story. We know there are deep mathematical inconsistencies in that formula. There are infinities we can't get rid of. And they hint at a deeper underlying formula, which will be even more powerful than this one. And so this search for the fundamental description of nature is only beginning. Well, uh, for myself, when I went into theoretical physics, I was drawn into cosmology, understanding the whole universe. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous that it works. It's crazy that there's, there's this subject. We can't understand how a bacteria works. And yet, modeling the whole universe turns out to be amazingly simple. We have the equations. We can calculate. We can make predictions. I've done it myself. We predicted what would be seen when satellites like this map the whole cosmic sky, the radiation from the Big Bang, and the predictions agreed. Uh, it's phenomenal. We have no right to understand the whole universe, but we do. Um, and and uh, so uh, I pursued my career at, at uh, Princeton and then at Cambridge, where I got to work with Stephen Hawking on the beginning of the universe. And uh, if you want to talk about that, I'm happy to come back some other time. But even as I was working on this uh, field, uh, I kept worrying about Africa. Uh, I'd left uh, those wonderful kids behind. As you feel about your country, I feel about mine. And I, in fact, feel we should all, because we all come from Africa. Uh, Africa's the birthplace of humanity. And I couldn't help feeling uh, there's something uh, you know, I need to do. And uh, by then, my parents had gone back. They were both elected to parliament. And uh, South Africa now had a fledgling democracy. Incidentally, my father is now chair of the ethics committee in parliament, responsible for uh, rooting out corruption uh, within South African parliament. Um, but uh, so worrying about South Africa, I went back. And uh, what could I do? Cosmologist is pra practically the most useless person <laughs> on the planet, <laughs> OK? Uh, it's not, it's not going to make you any money. It's uh, never going to lead to a commercial application. But uh, what could I do? Well, it turned out that maths and science was a, was a, was a strategic problem for Africa. 
If you don't have maths and you don't have science, you will not enter the modern age. It's as simple as that. And so I went back and helped to found a new institute, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. We bought a derelict hotel and converted it into a state-of-the-art postgraduate education facility, recruiting the best students from all over Africa in maths, physics, engineering, computer science, put them in a hotel, brought the best lecturers in the world to teach them, and they would come because they're interested in Africa. And uh, we did this as an experiment. How would it work? Um, the amazing thing is it worked brilliantly. Uh, and what it showed me, as somebody who'd worked at Princeton and Cambridge, these prestigious institutions, is that they are not the answer. There are plenty of spaces for much more innovative educational centers uh, in the world. And frankly, I think that's where the future will go. It will go to enterprise. Enterprise should be attached to education and science. And this was our little attempt at educational entrepreneurship. Here in this picture, so Ames has operated for, uh, for eight years now, very successfully. We have uh, 415 students have come, passed through Ames. And 95% of our alumni have gone to master's and PhD across all of science. And some of them work in the most advanced scientific pro projects in the world. One works at the Large Hadron Collider. Another at the Na National Institutes of Health on HIV AIDS. Another is a top financial modeler in the city of London. Uh, he's a failure because our, it wasn't our intention to help London resolve its financial crisis. <laughs> But uh, there he is. He's practically a genius, and he works for Barclays Bank in the city of London. But 78% of them remain in Africa, and they are filling university positions. They're working in companies. They're working in government, in research centers. And they are beginning to form the skills base which will drive Africa's development. Um, in 2008, we launched, based on the success of the center, and I could talk for an hour about it. We rethought everything. The traditional university model is running out of steam. It really needs recreating. The style of teaching needs changing. It's got to be interactive. You've got to treat students for their potential. Not, you don't judge them and say, you are a failure. You are a success. You've got to see the potential in them and let that emerge and let them develop their minds. Don't tell them what to think, allow them to. That's the spirit of the center, and it's been phenomenally successful. In 2008, uh, the head of NASA, Michael Griffin, came with Stephen Hawking and two Nobel Prize winners to help us launch a new plan. And the plan was to create 15 of these centers all over Africa within a decade. Uh, we called it the Next Einstein Initiative because it's our dream that the next Einstein will be an African. Um, in 2010, uh, one of our alumni uh, spoke at TED, a TED conference. And I just want to tell you a little bit about her. Daphne Singo from a, a rural province in northern South Africa. Uh, she's wearing her traditional tribal uh, dress. But she's actually uh, just finishing a PhD in nuclear engineering. And she will, will be one of the leaders of uh, technology in Africa in the future. And she gave this talk at TED, which brought uh, 2,000 people to their feet when she quoted her mother, who was a domestic servant. Uh, her father was an alcoholic. And her mother was a domestic servant who put her through school and told her daughter uh, these words, that education is the husband that will never let you down. <laughs> and uh, just two weeks ago, we opened our second center uh, in Senegal, in a beautiful ecological reserve just south of Dakar, by the sea, uh, virgin uh, natural forest. And uh, uh, that's the center. It's in a renovated facility. A big building is under construction. And over here, you'll see the first group of students, uh, 35 students from 20 different countries, including our first Somali uh, Ames student. Um, 
uh, and uh, together they are uh, uh, entering their graduate careers, and I'm sure we're going to see them do remarkable things. Uh, the director is over here next to me, Mamadou Sangare. He's one of Africa's most distinguished uh, mathematicians. And next to him, Klaus von Klitzing is a German Nobel Prize winner from 1985. Uh, and there's some solar panels which were donated by a German company. Here is Klaus uh, <laughs> doing what we do at Ames. You see, uh, Ames is a place of joy. Uh, it, it's a center where the whole person is nurtured. One of the most important outcomes of Ames is the students come in and they have been frankly traumatized as young people in Africa by all the adversity they faced. Ames is a safe house and, uh, and, and they really thrive within this supportive environment. And uh, Ames, uh, every party, of course, being Africa, is a lot of dancing. And, uh, and here we are. Uh, celebrating the opening of Ames Senegal. Um, I'm going to skip this. Well, <laughs> that's part of my, uh, my life. The other part uh, is my cosmology and uh, my physics. And so while I was busy setting up Ames, there was a far more enterprising person in Canada, a name of Mike Lazaridis, uh, the inventor of the Blackberry. Now, Mike is a very, very rare individual who um, spotted an opportunity, in my opinion, that everyone had missed. Not just smartphones, which he invented, but an even more profound one. When Mike made a fortune out of smart smartphones, he wanted to start something. He said, I want to go to the root of innovation. I want to support the foundations of all innovation. What is that? It's theoretical physics. So I'm going to fund a center for theoretical physics in Waterloo, Canada, called the Perimeter Institute. And many of the, the philosophy was the same as, uh, as at Ames. It's a public-private partnership. It's entrepreneurial. It, it moves quickly. Um, it's, uh, it's, it has an extremely ambitious goal, which I'll tell you about. Its focus is on quantum theory and space-time. These are the two most fundamental notions in physics and actually all of science. The laws of physics, the arena for physics. Here's a picture of the vacuum. The vacuum in physics is one of the most interesting things. Everything is fluctuating in and out of existence all the time uh, due to quantum effects. And as we now know from observations, the vacuum has energy. The vac which is one of the most mysterious things in physics. Where did that energy come from? So Perimeter set its goal as a deeper understanding of quantum theory and space-time. And as a uh, professor at Cambridge, I was shocked. <laughs> How could you be so daring as to declare that you are going to stimulate new breakthroughs in our understanding of these things? But that was the intention. And so three years ago, I moved to Perimeter and Ames became part of the outreach mission of Perimeter. Uh, so these things are now uh, organizationally connected. And Stephen Hawking, my colleague from Cambridge, uh, came with us to, to help uh, uh, conceptualize what we would do. I remember when I told Stephen, I'm thinking about moving to Canada because the guy who invented the smartphone loves physics. And he's founded a center the, the dedicated to quantum theory and space-time. I sort of said it without thinking, and Stephen's eyes just lit up. What? <laughs> How could anyone do something like that? And so Stephen came and helped us uh, conceive of an expansion of the Perimeter Institute called the Stephen Hawking Center, which we opened uh, last week. And uh, it's a spectacular place. The whole facility can house 250 researchers in the foundations of physics, of uh, theoretical physics. Uh, it's a very interactive, it's like a spaceship, basically, this building. It's a mixture between a spaceship and a playhouse. Um, and that's the spirit in which we run it. Um, here I have a diagram which, uh, which uh, echoes uh, Ike's diagram. 
Um, how <laughs> there was no arrangement of, uh, adv in advance, but we're in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> We're absolutely in the zone. You see, pardon? Didn't get it. Um, so they're the foundations of the subject, quantum theory, quantum information, quantum foundations, space-time, quantum gravity and string theory are leading approaches to space-time. Then we have physics on small, medium, and large scales, particles, condensed matter, cosmology, and complex systems. But you see, what's really important is that perimeter's at the center of all these things. One of my favorite sayings at perimeter is there are no groups. People say, how many postdocs for our group this year? I, uh, what groups? There are no groups. What we're all about is collisions between different approaches which will lead to something uh, genuinely new. And so we, you see, this is one of the diseases of academia, is you have physics and maths and engineering and computer science, then within those departments, they fragment into groups and they all fight each other for resources and everything slows down. At Perimeter, no, we have research focuses which bring people together. And I'll show you uh, just three of them, our top priorities. So one of them is quantum field theory and particle physics. These are the, the fundamental description of of particles and forces is quantum field theory. And particle physics, as I said, now has the greatest experiment of all time going, the Large Hadron Collider. It's a huge area of opportunity where techniques from all these fields are actually combining. And Perimeter has, um, as I'll show you, uh, the leading young group in the world in that field uh, of developing our fundamental description of particle physics. Black holes, we're about to be able to observe uh, black holes. These are the most weird objects in the universe. Uh, if you fall in, you never come out. But there's one in the middle of our galaxy. Uh, it's about a million solar masses. And, uh, and as I'll show you, we're about to see it uh, in, in exquisite detail. And then quantum materials. This is the next basis, the next technological revolution. You see, every, all the devices you use. I mean, what's a BlackBerry or an iPhone? It's just theoretical physics in a box. That's all it is, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, the transistor was invented by a theoretical physics physicist. Maxwell discovered the laws of propagation of radio waves. That, that's what's in one of those devices, just theoretical physics. Quantum materials is a whole new horizon of a type of, of, of materials which will drive the quantum electronics of the future, which will be infinitely more powerful than what we use today. Um, so quantum fields and particle physics, here's CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, 27-kilometer tunnel uh, underground. And uh, there we have black holes. And this is a futuristic picture of an experiment called LISA, which will be in space, we hope, in 10, 10 or so years, uh, which will uh, detect gravitational waves, waves in space-time, produced when black holes uh, merge. And so, uh, you see, our field is all about young people. Um, it's, it's about uh, finding the most gifted, talented people worldwide, getting them as quickly as possible to a center where they can uh, develop their potential. So here we have a Portuguese, an Italian, uh, an American, a Colombian, an Israeli. These are uh, our brilliant young quantum fields and particle physics uh, researchers at Perimeter. In black holes, here's a picture of two black holes merging and emitting, spewing out uh, gravitational waves, which will be seen by detectors like this one, LIGO, one kilometer arms on a side. In, uh, w w there are uh, two such stations, and uh, they will uh, detect these signals produced by gravitational wave, gravi by black holes colliding. So Perimeter has joined LIGO, this experiment, and, uh, and uh, there are other techniques using neutron stars. Uh, you, you observe neutron stars and essentially use them as a giant gravity wave telescope. Um, and these are some of the young people. 
This person, Avery Broderick, is the first person to ever make an image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. He did that last year. And over the next few years, that image is going to become more and more uh, refined so that we really see the shadow of the black hole. Uh, in quantum materials, uh, just last week, and this goes back to Newton, we've just appointed a chair uh, at Perimeter called the Newton Chair. One of the strange things is that there was no chair in the world named for Isaac Newton. Just think about that. The founder of modern science and mathematics, and nobody thought to name a chair after him. Well, we have, and, uh, and we'll be uh, announcing uh, four more chairs for Maxwell, Bohr, uh, Einstein, and Dirac uh, to really uh, build uh, strength in depth. So we have 50 faculty out of uh, 250 researchers. Because we have a saying at Perimeter that today's theoretical physics is tomorrow's technology. And if you look at history, it's blindingly obvious this is the case. Why should it not be true in the future? Uh, and uh, we believe it will be. Uh, this is what others are saying about us. And let me go back at the end to this picture. I hope I've convinced you that there's plenty of space for uh, enterprise in the field of advanced knowledge, of sharing and creating advanced knowledge. We need, to, we need more of these places. We need more places in the world where people generate uh, important discoveries. And I would say thanks to companies like Google and people like all of you, the world is speeding up. Traditional institutions like universities and research centers move slowly. We need 21st century spaces and communities which advance the frontiers of understanding and create the breakthroughs which will define our future. Thank you. <laughs>